What about that? Before you bless the ears with this conversation, I'm just going to fire through a shameless plug. I know I said I was going to do this, but don't forget that the podcast is on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So, you're able to download and listen wherever and whenever. And while you're there, if you feel like leaving a rating and a review, that would be greatly appreciated. But if not, it's all good. The podcast is also on YouTube. So, if you could show some love there by subscribing and sharing with your friends, then we'll be mates forever. All you need to do is type in Keeping a Drill with Robbie, and I look forward to this journey together. Cool plug over. Let's get into it. Hello and how are you Tory sports lovers out there? My name is Robbie Gillette and welcome to conversation number 11 of the Keeping It Real with Robbie podcast where we chat all things from the mental side of sport to stories, laughs and banter. Whether it's the old pigskin or the old leather ball, we've got you. Today I'm chatting to Darren de Pavillon about all things from Protea's debuts to the frustrating two years of injuries that put him out of a franchise contract. I hope you guys enjoy and let me know what you guys think. How are you? No, I can't complain. Eh? A little cold this side. But, yeah, sure. uh, Cave, Cave Town's been storming, so it's been pretty chilly. I'm, I'm brave in a t-shirt today, but, you know, in a, in a, <laughs> I just had to go with the t-shirt. I had to go with the t-shirt. Um, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. It's awesome to be in the presence of a pro tier. Uh, I, think, I think it's going to be one of the best ones yet. You know, when I was doing further research into, into Darren, I, uh, you know, I, I found myself getting really, really excited just to tap into to an athlete's mind that's been through, like, Lank injuries, uh, and, and to get um, his, his his kind of mindset on that, and and yeah, just his perseverance and dedication. So I'm very excited to chat. So thanks for coming on. It's basically, no, what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Bro. Glad uh, glad I could. Awesome. Uh, do we do we chat golf yesterday, or? Yeah, rather not. Huh? Rather not. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was <laughs> I heard a thing today. I was like. A bad day on the golf course is better than a bad day in the office. So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta look at the bright side, yeah. <laughs> yeah, look, that's fair. We uh, we used our off, we had like an off week this week, so we used it to okay. get a few rounds in, which is yeah. quite nice. And are you guys back at training now? Yeah, so there's been a group of us that has been allowed to train. Um, we there were a few guys included in that uh, cricket South Africa winter winter group. Okay. So we we've been training for. It was a couple of weeks now. There was a stage where we weren't too sure, so we stopped for a little and now we're back at it. But um, as of Monday this week, everyone will be back at training and so on. Obviously, we do it in like small groups and stuff like that. Um, quite different. This new no- normal everyone seems to be talking about. But uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. <laughs> you and me both. Eh? You and me both. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, looking forward to sort of, sort of having the whole squad back. We've had a few gym sessions here and there. Um, so I have been able to see a couple of the teammates, but uh, it'll be nice to sort of see a few more faces. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but how's how's lockdown been other than training? How's it been? Like I see you, I see you've done your, you've got a YouTube channel and that that Instagram page, guys. Honestly, check it out; it's phenomenal. I'll, I don't know how I'm still new to this, but I'll try to tag you or, or put it in the description or something. But I seriously like have a look at his his YouTube and his his Instagram page. It's proper. I appreciate it, bro. Thank you. Yeah, it was just something I, something I got into actually a long time ago when I was struggling with my injuries and so on. And uh, obviously now I've had a bit of time to sort of get back into it and so on during the lockdown, which has yeah. which been quite cool. Yeah, it's been. Uh, I was, I was actually looking at all the stuff and I was like, that, I, I followed. I said, it's so aesthetic. Like if you if you're having a bad day and you want to see something cool, go check his page out. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. But yeah, can you can you chat us through your early career? Like from from school days to to kind of uh, before you got your injuries, that whole had that that space there. Yeah, look, I mean, I was pretty much born on the side of the cricket field. My uh, my old man played cricket for years. He actually still plays. He's from fifty eight now, and he's still trying to play. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so I was pretty much born into it. Um, it's something him and my mum loved keepers for years before I even came into the picture. So it just kind of bred into me. Um, yeah. I grew up in a small town called Impangeni down in Zululand here in KZN. And um, I was fortunate to, enough to go to a good school there where I had decent coaching. And um, it's sort of, I got to a period where we were looking high school and my parents thought, well, we're in quite a niche here because obviously it's such a small area and so on. So you don't get to play the big schools where a lot of the guys come through that, that obviously pursue sport. Um, so yeah, they, they decided they were going to send me to boarding school. I ended up picking to go to Maritzburg College. Um, yeah. I was very fortunate at college. I uh, got a little break in grade nine to, to start playing first team cricket and it went fairly decently for me. Um, I think that was sort of 
where in my career I thought, hang on, maybe cricket is is something I can do after after my career. Before that, I played all the sports. I loved all the sports. I just wanted to play any sport that I could. Um, so yeah, I sort of once grade nine, I made first team cricket. I then decided I'm definitely not going to play rugby at college. Everyone was so much bigger and stronger than I was. So I definitely amen. wasn't taking that risk. Amen, amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I ended up playing hockey in the in the winter throughout my years at college, but uh, cricket obviously became the main focus from grade nine, and that was sort of where the journey started. You know, I mean, no one really understands how it works after school. I didn't. I mean, I was never a big follower of the South African system in terms of franchise cricket and so on. I only really knew the Dolphins because where I was from. Um, so yeah, it was quite interesting to come from school into first class cricket. Um, I was fortunate I got a bit of taste um, with practices and stuff like that whilst I was in matric to join the inland side. So I sort of had that sort of stepping stone into it. But, uh, but yeah, nothing can really prepare you for three, four days on a, on a cricket <laughs> field coming, coming from a couple hours of bowling every day uh, yeah. in school to, to first class cricket after that. Um, but yeah, I was, I was really fortunate to know the Dolphins uh, were keen to get me on board straight out of school. So I joined up with the KZN. I finished the season with KZ in inland. I think there were like three games left after after the school year. So I played those three games. And um, during that period, Lance Kluzner was very involved. And in, he was obviously the Dolphins head coach. He was very in, involved with, in getting me to the Dolphins. Um, so yeah, he, he threw me straight in. I joined up with practices with the main squad and stuff like that whilst I was on a semi-provincial contract. Okay. And... Uh, and yeah, I was really fortunate, you know, at the end of my first year out of school, I was very fortunate to make my Dolphins debut and my career sort of took off at, at quite a decent pace and I was very fortunate. I got opportunities at a young age and I was very fortunate that it went really well for me. Um, and yeah, it sort of got me, got me to a point where I just started playing a bit more frequent. I'd started playing, um, I'd started playing Wipo cricket for the Dolphins, which uh, took a couple of years for me to do. Um, I played one T20 in my first two years, but that didn't go too well. I met up with Chris Gale on my debut, so, so uh, it took me, it took me a few long years to get another T20 game for the Dolphins. But, uh, but yeah, all in all, sort of, I had probably a dream start to franchise cricket. Um, and then, yeah, early on in, in, when was it? It was 2015. I, uh, I went into the off-season and throughout the whole uh, start of my career, the first few years, I was struggling with a bit of a shoulder issue. Yeah, and um, I remember saying to the physio, I was like, it, "It's not serious, but it's just niggly, you know. It just keeps like getting a pinch in my shoulder, or whatever." So we treated it throughout the years, and then in 2015, we finally sort of made the decision: "Hang on, let's go get a scan. Let's see mm. what's actually going on in case we make it worse." And that's when he sent me he sent me for an MRI, and we picked up one or two things that needed needed to be sorted out. I needed to get a bone shaved. Okay. So we spoke to a few specialists, and he was like, "Look." It's a pretty, pretty simple procedure. It'll be about 11 weeks yes. out, I think. <laughs> 11 weeks? <laughs> okay. uh, no, 11, 11 weeks. So we were sort of looking like, okay, season starts in 12 weeks. Through, through what he's saying, I should be able to maybe, maybe miss a week or two, you know, before yeah. season starts. So we decided, let's do it, let's do the op. And um, whilst I was actually in the op, he managed to find a tear that the scans didn't pick up. I had torn my labrum. So they obviously had to do a repair on the spot there. So they ended up putting two anchors into my labrum. So I ended up being out for 16 weeks, which means I missed the first half of the, the franchise four-day campaign, which obviously at that time was sort of where I was getting a lot of my game time was the four-day cricket. Yeah. Um, Best cricket, by the way. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. I'll, I'll <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I sort of came back into... In some mix and obviously had to go up into or go down sorry into the amateur squad and uh, I joined up with the guys we went down to Pretoria we played uh, Northerns um, it was my first game back after what 16 17 weeks and it wasn't the greatest weekends with me I think I was still struggling a bit niggly but uh, really underperformed you could say but um, <laughs> But yeah, I managed to get through it. Obviously, a bit more confidence getting through a three-day game. I, was, I had to play the one-day game. I wasn't meant to. But um, a couple of guys picked up injuries. So I got thrown into the one-day game as well. Um, and yeah, I sort of managed to get through that. It just started maybe building a bit of uh, momentum, getting through my first game, trusting my shoulder. Yeah. And um, I went down to Oatsu and again with the B side and fourth ball of the innings. Uh, 
I wouldn't say I landed badly. I actually don't know what happened. But in my delivery stride, as I came down on my back foot, I ended up fracturing my fifth meds tarsal in my foot. Jeez. So obviously, I had to leave the field four balls in. I've just spent 16 weeks in the south of the field and the second game back. I haven't even lasted them over. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so I ended up taking three months out. We decided we weren't going to op. I didn't want to go through the op route again. I was going to let it heal naturally. It was honestly, it was such a tiny little fracture. Um, so yeah, I ended up, I think it was about three months. No, it wasn't even that long. It might have even been a couple of weeks, six, seven weeks. Um, to let it heal, went for scans. The scans were sort of showing that it had healed. Um, there wasn't any, any fracture visible anymore. So I went back, I played a club, club game, second ball of the innings again. As I landed, boom, felt something go again. Oh, my gosh. Again, <laughs> what they see. <laughs> oh, it's literally second ball, second ball back. And um, we couldn't quite work out what it was, but what they sort of thought may have happened was I, um, I forget what the, there is a term for it, but like, uh, oh, what's it called now? It's uh, like a sheath that grows in between in yeah. between bones. So it shows up, I think, uh, fibrous tissue, that's what it's called. Yeah. And um, so what actually happens is in scans, it, it looks like the, it looked like my foot had healed. So they gave me the all clear, but uh, obviously it hadn't healed and wasn't strong enough yet to get through uh, yeah. the sort of uh, load that I put on my feet. So unfortunately that went again. So we decided this time we we're going to do the op. Um, so yeah, they ended up putting a screw in my foot. And, uh, and yeah, that was about the, Three months out, I think overall. So I ended up obviously missing the full season. I think I actually came back with like two weeks left. And um, I managed to get a B-side game in and the Dolphins were just about to go into the one-day stuff. And, um, and I played a game against Namibia for the B-side. And during that game, I sort of picked up a bit of a niggle in my quad. Didn't think too much of it. Um, uh, I did really well. I had a decent game. So there was talk that I'd be thrown back up into the Dolphins squad again, which was obviously exciting. And uh, I think we had a week in between that game, the Namibia game, and then the next Dolphins game. So I was training with the guys and so on. And throughout training, I kept, my quad just kept getting, feeling worse and worse and worse. We kept trying to go through it. They named me in the squad, but they asked me to pass a fitness test. And unfortunately, I couldn't pass a fitness test. I was just in so much pain with my quad. Um, so yeah, they ended up sending me in there and it, it turned out I had a 16 centimeter tear in my quad that I'd obviously picked up and obviously through bowling that whole week, it just got worse and worse and worse. It's literally so, like your whole quad, <laughs> 16 yeah, centimeters. Yeah, literally, literally half my quad, yeah. So it wasn't, oh. yeah, it was a bit of a messy one. Um, I think I ended up in about eight, nine weeks recovery there, which obviously meant I missed the whole season. Um, so yeah, I spent the off season getting strong, getting fit. Um, this is it. Back next year, sort of wrap the season off. Um, <laughs> and uh, we were playing a warm up game in Marisburg. We had the nuts down, I think. And uh, I bowled about eighteen overs on day one. I was feeling quite good. And woke up the next morning, and I felt like my back had just seized up. It'd gone into like this hectic spasm. I couldn't flip and straighten. The moment we start complaining about backs as fast bowlers, guys are like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is dangerous territory. Um, so yeah, I got sent for scans straight away. And in the scans, we found quite a, quite a few stress fractures. We found five stress fractures. Um, Would that have been from landing? Like, uh, I don't know, I'm not too sure. But how, how would that have come about, that stress fracture? Yeah, look, it's... Workload. A, lot of, a lot of different actions and workload. Um, it is mainly actions. A lot of actions are worse off than others. Um, I don't think I'd ever really had an action where guys were worried about, about me being injured. It wasn't really a bad action. Um, so it was never really a concern with me sort of coming throughout the school ranks and so on. And because I had never really had problems in school um, that were serious enough to keep me off the field. Um, we sort of never really were concerned about that. But, uh, but if, if I'm honest, if you go and scan most fast bowlers' backs, I'm pretty sure you will find gonna, some you look hard enough, you look hard enough. That, that same repetitive motion and so on on your, on your back. Yeah. It, it puts so much, so much stress on your back. And that's why I think a lot of young guys do actually pick up stress fractures quite, quite early on in their careers. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd, they'd found five in mine. Um, two or three really like small ones they weren't too concerned about but the one big one was my old five um 
at a bilateral stress fracture. So sort of what happens is the cage, your um, spine sits in, I'd broken on that side and on that side. Um, so it was just sort of ca causing my disc to slip a little. Um, not too, con oh, wasn't, they weren't too concerned about the disc slipping, but, um, but obviously with the two fractures, they, they needed me to sort of sit out. So straight away they were like in a brace, three months in a brace, and then sort of looked to get into, into rehab and stuff like that. So um, it was a bit of a shock, but I, I then obviously, I went about a month in this brace and I kept saying to our trainer, I was like, listen, I really don't think it's my spine. It feels like my muscles are stiff. Like I don't feel like my yeah. spine is flat. I, I remember what my foot felt like when I broke the bone and this doesn't feel like bone that's sore, you know, it's muscle. Um, so after about a month, they sent me for, I forget, CT scan, CAT scan, one's your head, another one's <laughs> uh, another one up sort of uh, temperatures, if I remember correctly. And what they sort of found through the scan was that all five of the stress fractures had shown some form of healing, okay. which to them then showed that none of them were actually a fresh injury. They were probably injuries that I've picked up over the years, but never noticed, you know, it's <laughs> never really been an issue. I've never been sore enough to stop playing or anything like that. Um, no. So yeah, we, we ended up actually treat, treating it like a muscle, a muscle injury for three months. They just made me smash core work, get nice and strong, get into the sort of best, best position I can be to sort of protect my back. Um, so fortunately I didn't end up missing the whole season in that. I think I came yeah. back three months in. Um, and then I forget what happened after that. I think I, I played a few B-side games, one or two sort of playing decently. Um, uh, I think what happened after that was I picked up a side strain. Um, so it was right towards the end. It was right towards the end of the season, I think, when I sort of came back from my back. Um, yeah. So uh, I don't think there were many games left. So I ended up sitting out a couple to rest a bit longer, and then picked up a side strain. So I ended up missing the last like two games, I think, of the season. Yeah. So that obviously that that had then been sort of a period of two years now where I hadn't. I literally, I'd played two amateur games. I hadn't finished a game and other than that one straight off to my shoulder up. So I ended up losing my contract. Um, yeah, yeah, I was, I, that was actually a question. I was like, how did, did the Dolphin, yeah. like, it must have had some serious, like, faith in you just to, to keep you on. But, yo. Yeah, well, that, well I, I was fortunate. So I just obviously signed a two-year deal with the Dolphins just before I went for the shoulder up. Um, so they were really good to me, you know, they looked after me, the training staff, the medical staff, they were so hands-on with my recovery for all of it, which hmm. helped me ridiculously. Yeah. But um, but yeah, obviously after two years of not playing, you've got to you've got to sort of somewhere yeah. that losses. So unfortunately for me, um, they let me go. So I ended up losing my Dolphins contract. Um, but yeah, very fortunately, uh, they were still happy to give me a semi-professional contract. Um, they were happy for me to go into, back into the amateur side, prove myself, get strong again, and hopefully stay on the field, you know. It's funny, us as bowlers, you know, you pick up a few injuries and all of a sudden there's that sort of cloud that comes over you being injury prone. But if I look yes. back before, yeah. before, I, before I chose to do my shoulder up, I don't think I'd ever missed a serious amount of games in my career, maybe one or two with a small niggle here and there going all the way back to grade eight, grade nine. So, uh, so yeah, it's funny how that sort of cloud sort of came over me and I obviously had to prove that I'd sort of passed this stage. Um, so yeah, I was very fortunate after that to sort of get through that period. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it was yeah, proper taxing. Um, Frustrating, maybe the word, huh? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> I mean, each time, each time it kept happening, um, I was living in a digs at that time with three mates. I kept saying to them, I was like, Again, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I, I couldn't be doing this. I'm sitting on the couch, everyone's going off to work and all I do every day in my routine is to go and go into the gym and do an hour of rehab and then come home and sit again. So yeah. it was quite taxing. Um, eventually it got to a point where I was like, I actually can't do this anymore. You know, I'm, mm. I'm nearly, I was about halfway through my degree at the time. I was like, I'm nearly finished the degree. Let's just get that on and, and then I'm done with cricket. You know, I can't keep going through this these emotions of sort of being sad, frustrated and, um, and yeah, fortunately my dad, each time I sort of had those negative thoughts and stuff like that, he was like, really, you're living out your dream. Like I understand yeah. you've lost your contract and you don't know where it's going to be, but we're in a position we can help you. Um, cause I mean, the, the hardest thing for me was obviously being living on a franchise contract. Like you pick up your debit orders and stuff like that. They were more yeah. than I was earning. 
And yeah. I've gone down to the low, gone chase more than I was earning. I can't even look after myself, which was probably yeah. the hardest to swallow. Um, but yeah, fortunately, my parents, I mean, they've always been incredibly supportive. Um, I don't think they actually missed a game ever. They live in Zuland, three hours from Maritzburg. I don't think they ever missed a Saturday sports game. Yeah, um, uh, geez, we oh, they are unreal people. <laughs> they it is, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, they've been, oh, they're my number one fans. Um, my cricket. Fan. <laughs> but, uh, cricket but, as uh, well, is like the whole day. <laughs> it's like, well, that's the thing, the amount of time they've sacrificed into my yeah. career, I think that for them was probably the hardest point to me wanting to just give it up there. Um, yeah. So yeah, unfortunately they were in a position where they could help me and um, financially, obviously off the field to still obviously pursue my dream whilst I'm still studying, you know. And um, and yeah, it's very fortunate that my dad could speak some sense into me a lot of the time. But um, yeah, well, I think we're all, glad, we're all glad you did. To be fair, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's uh, it was it was an incredibly emotional time. But I think it's looking back now, I think it was probably a good thing. A good thing for me i think i came back a lot more hungry than i did um, yeah. i think being as fortunate as i was to get opportunity and taste a little bit of success early on in my career um in terms of franchise cricket obviously um i think you sort of you sort of take it for granted and you think yeah. it comes easy because you do get that opportunity straight out of school you didn't have to work for it and all of that so um so yeah i think i definitely sort of sat on my ass a bit i could have worked a lot harder a lot younger um and uh, i think sort of the time away from the game made me realize you know you're living your childhood dream um your dream was always to play for the pro tiers, but now all of a sudden you're going if i'm gonna play cricket i just need to finish my career earn a bit of money so i can set my life up and then go yeah. into a job mm. and that was sort of the psychological effect on me it sort of went my dream of playing for the pro tiers is gone uh, yeah. It doesn't matter to me anymore. I just want to play cricket. I want to get back on the field. It doesn't matter where I play, how I play. I just want to set up my life and then move on to whatever's after cricket. Um, because how? obviously in my contract, that was sort of the thing. Like, hang yeah. on, this can go any moment. So I sort of realized I'd fallen behind a lot of people um, in yeah. sort of the CSA R's and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, like I said, that was sort of where my head went. I was like, you know what? The dream is not to play for South Africa anymore. Well, or it doesn't. It doesn't seem realistic anymore. So it was obviously always still a dream, but it yeah. just didn't seem realistic to me anymore. Um, when when did that mindset change? When did you think now, okay, flip, uh, this is now the dream again. This is reality. Uh, it's going to happen. Like when did that? And then what what triggered that? Or was it just over time you just realized, well, I, I need to get this going. Yeah, it's just to be honest, it, it probably happened when I got the call up. Um, I think the the confidence in my my own sort of game started coming back as I'd finished a season. Um, I obviously played that season in the amateur side, and right at the end of that season, I got called in to to join the uh, fifty over comp for the Dolphins. Um, I played the semi final. I got called right and got thrown into the deep end. Into the thrown deep end. Into the final, yeah. um, and uh, Sort of as I built the confidence, as I played a bit more, um, it sort of started going in. I hang on, maybe I can sort of get myself into that mix and so on. But again, it, it wasn't as if it was like the goal is to play for South Africa. For me, it was yeah. the goal is I've got to milk my career. I've got to try use it to to get me to 30, 32 years old, have bought a house, sort of yeah. financially look after myself. You know, it's what I've got going for me. Um, but I think only re really when I got the call calling me up did I click and go you know what it's, you 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 think you've had the worst season of your life and you've just fortunately yeah. through certain circumstances you've been given this opportunity and I think that was sort of the moment where I went you know what actually the dreams it's back on you know I, I yeah. want to play more just playing that one game that taste made me hungry and it makes me want so much more I uh, I can I can imagine and, and what is the difference between so domestic cricket at the moment, right? So four-day cricket, I think it's Sunfoil series. Yeah. Uh, it looks pretty unforgiving, if I'm being honest with you, with like, you, you like, I've, I've, I've driven past a couple like at Newlands, you look through and there's like, there's no one watching. What, what is the difference, like that difference you felt for, for the pro tiers and then for say a, a, a franchise game with, with regards to how you looked after within the team? I always, I, I've always, I've always wondered that. Like, what's the difference? Like, hotel-wise, do you guys go from like a 
a four star to a five star? Is it like is the is the lunch on the lunches better? All, all that kind of stuff. What what's the differences there? Yeah, look, um, we really well looked after, sort of in both. Okay. Basically, and and uh, the national side. I I can't really comment on the national side because I wasn't really involved for too long. I was literally the the twenty four hours that I was involved with the national side. I was literally flying from Durban, getting to Joburg. I think I arrived in Poch at like five in the evening, um, having a whole bunch of meetings, um, and then sort of woke up the next morning and had to play. So I didn't really get to experience. Okay. I think what it would be like if you were selected to go on a tour or to be involved in the whole series. Um, but definitely the professionalism is incredible. Um, you've got everyone caters to your own needs. You've got people that if you need something, they'll do it for you. Um, okay. whereas, whereas obviously from the domestic side, we still have that, but obviously there are less, less people involved. Um, but just sort of going back to what you were saying earlier about sort of the four day stuff in, fran in uh, franchise cricket, that's probably the toughest. That and three day cricket on the amateur side is probably the toughest cricket yeah. there is because we have no one watching our games. There's very <laughs> little people watching first class games. Obviously, the Wapo cricket's a bit different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what they always say. That's, that's proper cricket. That's tough cricket. You know, you've got no one supporting you. You've got to go out and give you all for four <laughs> days in a row. The body's tired on day two, day three, day four. Um, and the thing so, is, yeah, with that's. That, it's like from 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 an outsider's perspective, it's it's that's not like club cricket, you know. That's like proper, that's professional cricket, and then you 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 couple that with no crowd, and it must be so tough. <laughs> it is, uh, you, it's it's a lonely, it's a lonely yeah. uh, thing like that, you know. Especially if things aren't going your way, you end up boiling for two days straight. Your legs are dead. <laughs> you haven't even got to day three yet, and your body's already wanting to give up. Um, yeah. So yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it's definitely my favorite format, but uh, definitely yeah. a stack to the body. <laughs> um, and then, so you obviously gained momentum now with no injuries, and then you, you, you were called up to the Pro Tours. How sweet was that? National Anthem, all the, how, how good was that? So, I don't, I don't know if you actually saw whilst we were doing the National Anthem, but I had to keep looking down because I knew if I looked up, I'd probably end up crying. I think it was <laughs> such, an emotional, it was such an emotional experience. Um, Someone actually said to me after the game when I when I ended up getting my first wicket. Someone said to me, they were like, "How can you not celebrate your first wicket?" <laughs> so sort of looking back on what I've been through, just that like relief, that feeling of relief that I've sort of achieved this dream and this has just happened was actually it yeah. meant more to me. The emotion sort of meant more to me than actually celebrating. I mean, if you go and watch any other wicket I take on the videos we have in Francis Creed, I love the celebration. <laughs> <laughs> no you got to um, celebrate everything. You got to celebrate everything. <laughs> but yeah, my first wicket there, it was just like, oh my word, that just happened. You know, I didn't even like consider celebrating that sort of relief that sort of came through. Um, and Aaron Finch as well. <laughs> it wasn't like it was a, a, a tale, you know. Aaron Finch is proper. Yeah, I know. It was an incredible moment. And also quite nice, obviously, Dave. Dave's a good friend of mine. And I've grown through the ranks at the Dolphins with yes. him. Uh, he was also a Marisburg College old boy. Obviously, he was a bit b before my time, so I didn't really get to, to know much in my school days. But obviously, we have that connection. And that yeah. was also quite, quite special for, for us, yeah. Yeah, well, Marisburg College must have had a field there um, <laughs> <laughs> on their social medias. <laughs> uh, but, but, Darren, who, who's the kit man's nightmare? Sure. It depends. Eh? I mean, you, you've always got to you've always got to look towards the keepers. They've always got the most. Yeah, pets, oh, yeah. They've always got extra pair of pads, gloves, and and so on. But uh, if I'm honest, sort of in our our franchise side, the Dolphins, um, I'm probably up there. If uh, <laughs> you, know, you won't know, but I, I wear three pairs of socks when I play cricket. After I fractured my foot, I decided I'd I'd put it. Yeah, into okay. it. Um, <laughs> I've always worn two pairs just to protect the, the toes and stuff. I used to struggle with a lot of, uh, I used to lose my to my toenail, a lot of my land yeah. foot. Yeah, so I started wearing two pairs of socks throughout my career. And uh, after I broke my foot, I started wearing three uh, three pairs. And I've just found it the most comfortable. It's definitely the heaviest. Yeah. But, uh, but the problem with that comes in is when we come off for lunch and my socks are soaking wet, I'm going to take six pairs or six socks off. So you know, <laughs> If you come into the change room after I've been bowling, nah, not pleasant. There's, not about, there's about twelve pairs of socks <laughs> all around my area, so uh, I'm probably I'm probably the villain when it comes to that. Uh, my area always stinks, and it's always uh, always pretty busy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who's the grittiest? 
Yo, to be honest, we've got quite a few guys, you know. Um, um, we've got a few guys in now from Joburg and to our side that they always say they sort of bring that tough gritness and so on, um, which, I mean, is probably true if you look at some of the guys that have done really well for us. But, um, but yeah, we've sort of, sort of, we've worked really hard on building this team culture and the guys that are the grittiest have led from the front. I mean, if you've looked at our, our stats, you've seen guys like Marcus Ackerman, Grant Rolofsson sort of leading the charts in both formats. Um, I think SJ Abia is probably one to add there. I think this season was the first time in a long time. I think Grant and him must have had a 50 partnership and keep us more than 50% of the games we played. Um, so yeah, when the, when, the going, when the going gets tough now, I think sort of built on the back of our team culture as well as sort of those, specifically those three individuals. Um, you can probably throw Kesha Maharaj in there. He captains our side along with Marcus when he's not involved. Um, so yeah, we've got a nice leadership core now that's quite a few gritty players. And I think that's sort of stemmed this culture that we're trying to create at the Dolphins. Yeah. Uh, just going back quite a bit, uh, I was just, it's come to my mind now. Can you chat me through, uh, yeah, me and, and the guys at home through the, the CSA contracting system? So like franchise level, I, I, I'm, I'm not too sure how that works. Is it, sen- are you essentially contracted? Or, or is it clubs? I'm, yeah, can you just tell us to that? Right, yeah. So, so what happens is there are three types of contracts. Um, you get your semi-professional contract, your um, professional contract, which is your franchise contract, and then you get your nationally contracted guys. So where we different, as far as I know, where we different from the rugby guys is they can be contracted to the Sharks as well as a national side, I think. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Whereas, whereas we are obviously different. So. Um, Every year, the new contracts get released and so on. Um, we can sign a max of two years um, on a franchise contract. Semi-pros, I think, are always one-year contracts. Um, only, only two years? Yeah, a max of two wow. years. So security-wise, security it is tough. And that's sort yeah. of why Jeez. a lot of the guys, I think that's what draws a lot of the guys to the UK, the guys that do go. Um, because, I mean, guys there are signing five, six-year contracts. But yeah, uh, then you kind of set for... Well, that's the thing, but, uh, but I mean, you've also got to understand it from a logistics point of view, you know, um, England, those kind of places, incredibly wealthy, they, they own a large portion or are a large portion of the RCC, so they see a lot more money in terms of that than pre yeah. South Africa would, I think. Um, obviously, I don't know exactly, but, um, but yeah, so a logistical point of view, that we sort of understand it, again, it's that security that's, that's always worrying, you know, you have, like me, you have a year or two where you struggle to stay on the park and that can be your career done, you know, if yeah. you aren't as fortunate as I was to go back onto a semi-pro, that can be the end of your career. Um, but yeah, so most of the time guys leave school, they join up with the semi-pro side, the amateur side, so that'll be like your Western province or your Borland, those kind of places. Um, so as far as I know, there's seven or eight guys that can be contracted on a semi-pro. It might be a bit more now. Um, so, obviously, you do well through there. You can go up to either a full franchise contract or what they generally call the rookie. They give sort of two youngsters a rookie contract, um, which is also a franchise contract. So, each franchise gets 17, 17 contracts. Um, Cricket South Africa funds the uh, unions. So they'll give money to the franchise, Dolphins franchise. It'll be a set amount of money. And that amount of money will go to purely paying the players. It can't go to anything else. It's got to go to your contracting. And you have the choice up to 17 players to, to contract. Um, and then what happens is you get your national contracts. So those are the guys that will sort of most of the time play all three formats or yeah. a lot of a certain format. Um, and as far as I know, I think there's 18 nationally contracted players. Okay. So if you're on a national contract, you don't, you aren't uh, affiliated to any franchise with a franchise contract. So what actually happens is the national guys can actually choose where they want to play franchise cricket. So if I were to sort of go up onto a onto a franchise cricket, I will I will say to them or voice to them, okay, I would still like to play for the Dolphins. Yeah. You know, if I were to move, I can say I want to play for the Knights and I play for the Knights kind of thing. So. Um, so they obviously have that luxury of getting to choose, choose where they want to play and so on. And, 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 of, and who regulates the, who gets paid what? Would that be purely on a club level? So it wouldn't be like out of the 17, two guys get like, I don't know, an X, X amount and then three guys get Y amount. Who, who, does the club regulate who gets paid what? Yeah. 
So, so our CEO, along with the board and so on, will sort of make that those kind of decisions. Um, and obviously, they've got to do the budgeting towards it. Obviously, every player will go into his contract negotiations, try and negotiate a bit more money yeah. and so on. They might try and negotiate a bit less if they can accommodate maybe a, a player they want to pay more. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's it's not as if you sort of sit on a certain level. Like if you're okay. 11th ranked player in the team, you get this amount. So it doesn't work like that. It's all sort of budgeted and negotiated. And and have you ever thought of, of heading over to the UK? Um, I've, I've sort of never really had the option to. Um, I don't have a passport or anything like that. Um, I think my dream was always to play for South Africa. So yeah. I sort of, that was, that was never a worry, never a concern. Um, when I lost my contract and sort of, when I lost my contract, I phoned around a few places. I tried to get myself involved in the National Academy for the second time, um, just so that I sort of had a bit of security and I could work with people that would help me overcome my injuries. Um, so in that period, I sort of went, maybe it's, maybe it's the right time to go, you know, I can't get a contract anyway. Yeah. Oh. Um, I was obviously struggling to get game time because I had to prove myself. Um, so I think over that period, uh, it sort of crossed my mind thinking about going. But um, once I sort of got back onto a franchise contract and sort of working towards the dream again, it's again it gets forgotten about. You know, it's yeah. every uh, it's every child's dream to represent his country at some at whatever his his chosen career path is. And I think that's always been my dream. So I, I don't think it was ever sort of it was ever sort of a want to go over. Um, obviously, the money. When we convert it, it's always a lot more. So that's oh, always yeah. going for a lot of people. But um, but again, I've always sort of said to myself, oh, I want to play for South Africa. That's the yeah. dream. That's what I want to do. So so yeah. So we we dream chasing here. Yeah. We dream chasing. I love that. Um, and then who who is on Orcs? Uh, most of the time, it's actually myself. Um, <laughs> I think it's just because I'm the one guy that's willing to bring the speaker into the change room. Um, <laughs> now, every now and again, uh, Cohen Mangru will get on, get involved there. Um, who else sort of plays? Yeah, I'll share us too, to be honest. Um, most of the time, it's myself. But and, and, uh, I travel with those little JBL speakers. Yeah. <laughs> so guys don't really have a choice. I'll stop it up before anyone can, can decide. To my, my, speak, my speaker, my music. And, and then what, what, what's most played? Yo, look, I'm a, I'm a DJ for the people, eh? I so I have to accommodate everyone. I've got to play music for all kinds of people. Yeah, I know you've got to do it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I've got a bit of a mix of everything. Some people will, some people won't enjoy it, but uh, oh. but I try to accommodate everyone on the side. Yeah, you can't please everyone. Let's be honest. I mean, hundred yeah. percent. There's some yeah, genres you just like. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a comment from the corner. What is this rubbish? Yeah, but yeah. No one enjoys it elsewhere. Yes, that's all right. <laughs> um, and then who who's fine the most? Yo, look, that that always becomes a little game. Eh? It depends on who's the fines master and who sort of challenges him the most. Um, but I think our, our captain, old Marcus Ackerman, um, he sort of he sort of <laughs> he revs the guys up quite a bit. So depending on who's who's fines chair. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it becomes more of a personal thing, depending on who's fine. Yeah. No, no, I, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, if we can just, how, can you chat us through your, your protest debut with with regards to the week? I, I know you said within 24 hours you were you were on the plane and, and, and in Poch, but that that call, that, that day leading up, uh, can you chat us through the whole experience? Yeah, so it was actually, yeah, it was, it was, it came as quite a shock to me. Um, I, I didn't realize I was like, like a genuine there. shock. Like, were you, did, did, you, yeah. did you have any like idea that you would, were going to be in the mix? Absolutely none. Um, sort wow. of looking, so I, at the start of the uh, 50 over campaign, I was actually struggling to get into the Dolphins side just with the makeup of the side and so on. We, we obviously went with the bowler less. Um, so I was unfortunate, I missed out the first. I think it was three or four games. Um, and when I, when I did sort of come back into the side, I had a couple of good games where I took a few wickets. So I sort of got myself into that top 10 uh, wicket takers list. But okay. looking back at the list, I think there was only two or three fast bowlers at the time on that list. I think a lot of them were spinners and more like medium pace bowlers. Um, so I sort of felt I was performing, but obviously I'd played a lot less games than the guys. So it was quite hard to sort of judge that. Um, 
And funny enough, we had actually just the night before I got the call, we had played the Lions here at Kingsmead and um, yeah. I'd had a terrible game. Um, actually, I, I felt like I was going to faint. I, I don't know what happened. I blew out completely. Um, I ended up leaving the field a few times and it was just one uh -huh. of those games. I sort of left the field and I actually felt embarrassed, you know, I was like, I can't believe. Oh, really? That. Yeah, I can't believe I did that, you know, it's not what I'm about. And um, again, I, I had a the field. Yeah, leaving the field. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I just it's I almost the... like a weird feeling, eh? I, I've done it a couple of times as well. You like, not certainly not <laughs> at a professional level at all, but you, like at any sport, you like when you go off, you're like, ah, that, that doesn't feel right. Like I should just finish the game. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's sort of what I felt like. I I, uh, I left the field twice. Once sort of during my bowling spell, I wasn't feeling too great. I went off and. Obviously, the game wasn't going well either for from my side, so it was okay. just like a double. I mean, it wasn't the greatest of games, and um, we were actually playing golf the next day, the Dolphins guys, and um, I think I got onto like the second tee box, and I was I was with T, uh, Keith Dudgeon, who sort of him and I sort of compete for a spot majority of the time yeah. in the Dolphins side, and literally we had just started the second we were in a cart and i looked at him and i was like i've actually got a feeling you're going to come in for me you know what i did last night was absolutely embarrassing i bowled so badly uh, um so i've actually i've got a feeling you're going to come in because we were our next game was in pe four or five days later and uh we played on the hole i just got onto the green he had finished off he had a great shot he had put it, <laughs> and uh, he was waiting for me i was just off the green and my phone started ringing i was like Who's this? I looked down, I saw it wasn't a number I recognized. So I lined up my putt, it kept ringing. I thought, you know what, hang on, let me, let me just answer. Let's answer this one. <laughs> so I ran to the car to answer the cart, and obviously that was the call saying that I'd been called up. Um, and obviously they were, they were playing the next day. So um, I was literally told, listen, we booked you a flight for 12 o'clock. I think it was 10 o'clock at the time. Um, I lived like 20 minutes from the golf course, so I had to drive all the way home. <laughs> I had to rush, to the, rush back to the uh, car park, get in my car, shoot home. I literally threw everything I could from the night before, all my tights, socks, yeah, and that yeah. stuff. <laughs> they, they probably weren't even dry yet from the wash. Um, got in my car, shot to the airport, um, managed to make my flight, fortunately. Um, sure. I, landed in Joburg. I literally landed in Joburg, met the team doctor at the car hire. We got in the car, we drove straight down to Poch. I think we arrived at about five, which was the start of the bowlers meeting. So I walked straight into the bowlers meeting, uh, sat in there for half an hour or so. We then went straight from the bowlers meeting into a team meeting. So obviously all the batters joined us then. Um, straight after that, so this is sort of, this is sort of when COVID had sort of started coming out. No one sort of knew what it was yet. We then had a debriefing from the doctor straight after that from like six to half, six, seven. Um, so I went straight from the team meeting into that. We then went straight from there. I decided I wanted to go to dinner with some of the guys. Like obviously I know, I've known a lot of the guys for years through franchise creates. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the guys are my age and a bit older. So I've sort of crossed bars with them throughout my career. Um, so I decided, you know what, let me go join them for dinner instead of sort of being by myself here. So I went with a couple of the guys to dinner, had a lacquer dinner, came back probably about nine o'clock. No, it was a bit later. It might have even been like half nine, quarter to ten-ish. And I hadn't even seen the team analyst yet. <laughs> so I went, I met up with him. He, he fortunately doesn't mind any times he's available. So um, I went, I sat in there with an hour going through the batting order of the Aussies. But during this time, I wasn't quite sure if I was playing yet. You know, it sort of sounded like I might be playing, but no one sort of gave me the, you're definitely playing kind of, kind of thing. But in the team talks, it sort of sounded like I was going to get a game. So, um, so yeah, I sat with him until about 10 o'clock and went back to my room, ended up going to bed somewhere around 11. Um, <laughs> So I literally, I literally had no time to overthink anything, let yeah. it settle, nothing. It was literally just straight into it, the rush of a day. Um, woke up the next morning. Obviously, I still wasn't really sure if I was playing or not. Um, and I think only sort of towards the end of the warm-ups did Boucher come to me and sort of say to me, I just want you to enjoy yourself, go out there, have fun. Um, and I think yeah. it was the perfect ending that they had sort of won the series already. So no one was really putting any pressure on me. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was actually really cool because I didn't get the chance to overthink things, to sort of get my head into the game, to sort of understand, wow, I'm sort of in this environment. Yeah, that's uh, what I was going to say. Like, when did you... 
Yeah, when did you realize like, okay, like, I'm I'm a protein now. Like, I'm I'm in the states. I was I mean, because I'm putting myself in your position right now. So I'm flying uh, within 16 hours. I've had dinner with the pro. I'm having dinner with the proteins. I mean, all these team meetings. When did you realize like, I- I'm a protein. Like, <laughs> I'm yeah. Like, <laughs> when when did you realize that? <laughs> yeah, look, I think the excitement of wanting to play obviously only kicked in once i was told you're in you're playing um, exactly yes <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, uh, once i got the call it was like wow i'm so excited this is the experience cool. but I, I didn't think i was going to get a game you know and yeah. um, and obviously the guys were leaving straight to india which was another important series so i think with us having won the series already they were willing to sort of try out because obviously you wanted to rest your lungis guys like that for india um yeah. so uh so yeah, I wasn't sort of quite sure, you know, it didn't really kick in, I don't think, until I was really like told this is happening. Um, and I think sort of looking back throughout my whole career, I've been very fortunate to sort of whatever side I've made, I've, I've always sort of, I've always sort of played in sides above my age group. Um, yeah. I always I played in the first team young, I played under 19 cricket young and so on throughout the age group. So I sort of have the mindset where I don't try panic whatever environment I'm in. But I definitely think I would have if I had time to overthink it. <laughs> you had a week uh, to think about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think it was a blessing in disguise that it was so rushed because I didn't really, I didn't get to the part where I, before the game where I was going, wow, this is really happening. It was yeah. sort of like, it sort of unfolded as the, as the day went out, as the day went on. And quite funny, I remember I was feeling on the boundary like the 40, 46th, 47th over. I remember, I remember <laughs> saying to myself, I was like, Come on, Darren, you've got three more days, uh, three more overs, and you've had, obviously not the best you can have, but you've had probably a dream yeah. start in the yeah. national game. And literally two balls later, I think one was cut to the boundary. I was a third man, and I literally <laughs> dived straight over, straight over the ball. Literally straight after, I've sort of told myself, you've got three overs to get through. You haven't made a mistake today. And then I went and did that. So, uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, but to get back to your question, I think... Uh, it only sort of really kicked in afterwards. Um, yeah. I think because they were flying to India straight afterwards, we didn't actually hang around much. We didn't go back to the hotel. We actually got back in a bus, drove through to the hotel in Joburg because they had to fly early the next morning. Um, yeah. So even still, it was still quite a rush, you know? Yeah. Um, I was fortunate I had my parents there. My girlfriend flew down as well. Um, That's special. And were, huh? Yeah, no, it was incredible. Eh? Yeah. And... Um, they were actually staying in the airport hotel. So once we got to Durban, I went to join them for dinner. It was probably about half nine, ten at night um, in the airport. And only really then did it sort of sink in what had, what had really happened. You know? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I love that story. <laughs> the three hours left, you haven't messed up yet. <laughs> Two more <laughs> later. I literally said to myself, I was like, you haven't made any bad mistake today. You've gone through the game. Yeah. And then like, two more days, I'm going to dive Pat's on, Pat on the back. Well done, Darren. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, how, how do you feel when you're at your best, like in complete control of your bowling? Because uh, cricket's quite a, a weird one where, where with bowling, it can change pretty quickly, like momentum-wise. Because like, how do you, how do you, when do you feel at your best? No, look, it's funny enough, someone actually asked me asked me that the other day and I wasn't sort of quite sure to to uh, answer it. Mm. But um, for someone like myself, I, I am very momentum-based. Um, yeah. When things are going really well for me, I, I just sort of try to step into another level and I try to maintain that. Um, if something goes down, then I shift down a little. I think that's often a fault of mine. Um, yeah. But... There are as days. I mean, you, you ask any fast bowler, there are days where you don't feel great, but everything just clicks and it goes your way and you, you might not actually <laughs> bowl your best and you pick up wickets and that causes you to bowl better. Um, so it is, it's a very momentum-based momentum based thing. You know, if the better you're bowling, I think the better you will continue to bowl because you're sort of in that positive mindset. Um, yeah. I think what makes, what makes cricket so difficult is that every ball is a competition. So if one ball goes badly, it's very yeah. easy to sort of to fall into a negative headspace and stuff like that. You know, it's not like you're competing for one end score. You're literally competing every single ball. If that ball goes yeah. wrong, who's going who's gonna to hold the pressure better? Who's going to cope better? Um, so, yeah, I think for me, to answer that question, for me, it's more a momentum-based thing. Um, 
I've always sort of had it in me where I want to be better than the batter no matter what. Um, I think it's a pride thing, who knows? But uh, it's yeah, like I said, yeah some, day, some days it's, for some reason it just feels like it clicks and it's such small margins. You know, speak of a fast bowler, if your run-ups a couple centimeters off on every step, you end up a foot difference in your delivery stride and your delivery, your action can all be different. So, um, so yeah, it's very difficult to sort of say to yourself, you're always going to maintain or be in the zone and stuff like that. There are a lot of factors that play into it, but certainly for me, the moment sort of my tail's up, I try and maintain that for as long as possible, which is oh, obviously- Ride that way, though. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, just just the Q and A left. Uh, how how are you doing for time? Are you good? Yeah, no, I'm hundred. Um, so this one is so. How important is keeping the energy from the first over to the last, especially to like inspire a team? Yeah, look, I think that's sort of that's sort of the role I try play. Um, I've been fortunate that in a lot of the sides I play. Um, obviously, it was different in the national side. You've got, got you've got your senior bowlers there already, but. And the majority of the cricket I've played, I've always sort of been the fast bowler and been the spearhead of the attack. Um, yeah. I've been fortunate to play under guys like Carl Abbott and Robbie Freilink and Craig Alexander early on in my career, where obviously they led the attack. But I think being the junior at the time, your energy sort of yeah. carries them as well. So you've sort of got that role to play as well. But, um, but I've always sort of proud myself on... When it gets late on in the day, uh, ball might start reverse swinging. I feel that's when I'm at my best. Um, obviously, you can only give what your body can give. You know, I, sometimes, yeah. I struggle, sometimes I struggle with cramps. So I get to the last over of the day and I can barely run in, you know. <laughs> uh, but no, it is incredibly important. And, you know, you listen to your batters talk and um, the rest of your teammates talk and they speak about sort of spells you bowled at the end of the day that that you were pumped up and it's incredible how all of a sudden the team becomes louder. You can have yeah. probably have the longest day in the field, but all of a sudden the team is louder. So I think that's sort of a role that most fast bowlers should play. Um, I think your, your energy that you can bring in times when it's tough can literally change your team's mindset, your team's energy within yeah. and over, within a few balls. Um, it, it always so think, it takes that, it's like a small change I find in cricket. It's, like, it's such a small margin that, that can change it, like shift momentum so quickly, which I think is good. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's all it is, really. It's, it's literally like turning on a switch. Yeah. It's, uh, one little thing sort of goes your way, or even if things aren't going your way, there's a spell, sort of a fast bowler comes on. He was yeah. fast, it's quick and that's exciting. People sort of, exactly, it's quick and yeah. exciting. So people sort of buy into that and they feed off that energy. Um, so it's something I think I've always proud myself on throughout my career. Um, I think last year was probably. I found it the most difficult I've been, obviously trying to find my feet again in franchise cricket um, yeah. after the two year break from it. But, um, but yeah, it's, for, for, for me, I think it's the most important thing as a fast bowler in your side is you actually can help change the energy in your side just from what you give, no matter where it is in the game from first over to 19th over in the day, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, what is the fastest ball you ever bowled? Yo, <laughs> the fastest ball I've ever bowled. Um, it's funny, every time I play TV games, for some reason the camera doesn't seem to be working. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the speed guns don't seem yeah. to be working. But, um, but last year, I'll... <laughs> well, that's the, that's the way I was sort of going to get to next. Is, um, I bowled a spell last year in the Ram Slam where I was high one forties most of most of my over, and I think the Jeez, biggest ball I ended up bowling was I think it was one fifty point two. But a couple of overs later, well, 10, 15 overs later, Keshav Maharaj, our off spinner, bowled one hundred and fifty five. So you can never sort of fight. You can never sort of fight uh, fight games with the speed guns. You know they are they are faulty from time to time, or a lot of the time. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I'd like to say uh, on my day when I'm going, I can definitely be consistently around 145 plus. But um, that is wheels. That is wheels. <laughs> yeah, it. I think again, it it comes down to sort of how it is on the day. You know, some days it clicks. Sometimes I feel like I can bowl the speed a lot, and I come out there and I don't. <laughs> I'm running out in the 30s, and I, I sit there going, "How oh, I'm feeling so good," but it's yeah. just not coming up. Yeah. So, um, 
so yeah, it is one of those things. But uh, yeah, I think, like I said, so that was the fastest ball that I was clocked at last year. Um, if I sort of look over my career, that was probably the quickest ball I've been clocked in. And, um, and yeah, I've, I've definitely felt I've bowled spells in my career that have been that quick. But again, you can never really trust the speed gun. So <laughs> um, and then what is it like in the Dolphin setup? Yeah, look, um, I sort of touched a bit on it earlier where um, we've been really focused on creating a team culture, like I said. Um, yeah. I think around the country, the Dolphins are caught, sort of known as the nice guys. You know, we've never really gotten into guys' faces, being tough, getting, when tough, tough gets going, you know, we've always, we've always competed, but we sometimes fall short. Um, yeah. So we, we've sort of hammered at building our side around a team culture and um, it's actually quite nice. We've got a little team room now going with a table tennis uh, thing oh, and in cool. um, So yeah, there's, the guys are sort of, start of are starting to enjoy being in each other's company. Um, if you sort of come in from outside, it looks like we're a large group of mates, you know, which is okay. what we're striving for as a team and obviously the culture that we're sort of trying to build at the moment. And I think successfully, um, it's sort of, it's coming across that way to people. And I think it's showing in our performances, you know, we're starting to, yeah. starting to win tough, tough sessions a lot more and um, we're starting to compete a lot more, which is ideally how you want to play your cricket. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then what is it like dropping a, a catch on, uh, what's it, in a pro game on TV? <laughs> Listen, you, you ask the right person, I've dropped a, a fair <laughs> share. <laughs> no, like, you, you know what the worst thing about it is, uh, being a bowler, you, yeah. you understand the pain that the bowler goes through. <laughs> you know, you, you want to sit there and sort of shout your laugh out to this guy, the poor guy that's dropped the catch. So it's always difficult. Um, but I think everyone sort of understands that it happens. Um, yeah. You can be the best, best fielders in the world, drop catches. Um, obviously, you pride yourself not to. And as long as you're sort of in the right place, making the right commitment, then whatever comes, mate, that, uh, but yeah, it's a terrible feeling. Eh? <laughs> and I've had my heart crushed a few times and I've crushed a few guys' hearts. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's not the greatest feeling in the world. Eh? Uh, is, but, but as you say, it's like, it's kind of the effort that they put in. I've, I've, I've played like club cricket, but it, it's like very, very like social or whatever. But if you drop a catch there, it feels the exact same. <laughs> the worst is when the guy, like, you can see he doesn't want to catch the ball. You can see he's like, uh, uh, no way. And he does something stupid. He's just like, can't, he does, doesn't even get to it. There's nothing more frustrating. <laughs> you, know, the worst, and you know, the worst thing about it as well is obviously at many points during the games, you often have, you, you'll have your best fielders in the most important positions. Obviously, yeah. towards the back end, Towards the back end of the innings, you want your fielders in the place where the batters are going to be hitting the ball to. Yeah. And uh, I often find myself in these important positions <laughs> where I do back my own catching. I'm not a terrible fielder, but yep. I'm a very confidence-based fielder. So if I put down a catch, it doesn't help when the team then goes, <laughs> oh, just swap with this guy, please, because we can't have him fielding there. That is uh, possibly the worst feeling you can go through. But it is a horrible <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's not the not the best feeling in the world, but uh, but yeah, it happens, and you've just sort of yeah. you've got to find a way to get past it and give the guy a tap on the back, apologize for yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, beers on me, guys, beers on me. <laughs> um, and then, do you have any advice for young fast bowler that wants to play for the pro tiers? Yeah, look, I am. Um, I've sort of always believed fast bowling is something that comes from within. I think you always have a natural ability. You either do or you don't. You have it or you don't. Um, there are there are different ways you can strengthen up and get nice and strong to put on a few Ks here and there. But a lot of the time, your your fast bowlers have been fast for a long period of time, a lot of their a long period of their lives, and yeah, yeah. Um, and you're born with fast switch fibers. So it is a it's an ability that someone can have. But I think being able to harness it and have the two percenters to get the two to five Ks quicker, I think, come from within. Because if you have that ability to bowl 140, 145 plus, you should have the ability to obviously do it consistently. Um, yeah. You've got to be fit enough to. But, um, but I think it's a hunger that comes from within. And um, you sort of, 
always use Dale Stone as an example. You watch him bowl, you feel his passion, you feel how yeah. there's that energy, you, there's that energy in his bowling. And I think that shows why and how he's able to bowl as fast as he has for as many years as he has, consistently as he has. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely something that comes from within. You never ever want to lose that hunger. Um, yeah. I think you've got to understand injuries happen. So I'll speak from a personal side of view. You've got to understand that injuries happen. Um, and you've just got to find a way to stay strong and get through that. You know, for me, I lost that hunger because of it. Um, I used to actually feel I was a lot more aggressive than I am now. You know, I've sort of calmed down as I've gotten yeah. older. And I actually think it's something that may have hampered me this last season because I just haven't had that like little switch or that little kick on where I think I can sort of access the best of my ability more consistently. Um, okay. So, you know, I just think it's to enjoy the game as much as possible. You lose that enjoyment factor, it becomes the hardest game on earth because you stand for four <laughs> days. You stand for four days. You can spend three of four days in a field standing. It's not yeah. pleasant. So you've got to love it. You've got to enjoy it. And, um, and you know, just keep that hunger, you know, as a fast bowler. Like I say, you've got to be hungry to bowl fast. You've always got to want every ball. You've got to want to bowl to the best of your ability. I've never been a big skill player where I shape it massively and I hit con areas consistently that's not me my general ability is always to be to bowl fast so that's what I'm yeah. trying to do be hungry and bowl as fast as I can each every time I bowl yeah uh, and and just to end off where where do you want to see yourself in the next two years where where is what's the goal is it one of those 18 contracts for for CSA uh what what is the what is the short term goal for for you now? Post COVID, yeah. obviously. <laughs> yeah, post COVID. Who knows what's happening? We actually don't even know when our season's meant to start. Fortunately, this has caught us in off season, so yeah, it's not costing us much cricket time at the moment. But who knows what's going to happen over the next few months? But um, but yeah, sort of like I said, I sort of touched a little bit earlier where. Um, the hunger is definitely back. Um, I think getting that little taste of international cricket, that competitive, yeah, that sort of competitive stage, um, I definitely want more. Um, the goal is to play as much as I can for the national side. But um, but I kind of understand where I sort of sit in the in the system at the moment. Um, there are obviously a lot of guys that have have played a lot more for the Pro Tiers, and they are obviously the ones in line to play for the Pro Tiers. Um, so yeah, my sort of my goal will obviously to be to do well for the Dolphins. I said to our coach the other day in our team in our one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, I said I really want to win a four-day uh, four-day campaign. Um, yeah, we've sort of always been sort of mid-table bottom, so I really want to challenge for that. So my my goal will be to lead from the front, as the from the bowler side of view, and do well for the Dolphins. Hopefully, win a trophy, and um, and yeah, whatever comes sort of in the international stage, so be it. But uh, I'm definitely working towards playing more consistently for the Pro Tiers, and uh, obviously becoming one of the contracted players. Yeah. Hopefully, within the next two years. Yeah, for sure. Well, Darren, thanks so much for for chatting. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I uh, did. I mean, I'm looking now. It's been an hour, and it felt like five minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I look forward to to seeing what the next two years brings and that that CSA contract. Um, and yeah, hopefully you'll come back on when when, when you've won that 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 four day competition. And yeah, thanks so much for coming. I've re I really really have enjoyed it. Thank you so much. No, cheers, Robbie. Thanks so much for having me, man. I appreciate it.